So welcome to session seven of CSIC 301 Information Security Principles. Today, we will be looking at security technology, specifically intrusion detection and prevention systems. Then we'll look at other security tools. As an outline, we'll touch on intrusion detection and prevention systems. Then we'll look at scanning and analysis tools. The recommended reading for this session is chapter 7 of the recommended text. Now, protection of organization assets relies as much on managerial controls as on technical safeguards, as we discussed in the previous session, that to be able to enforce information security, it's not just the duty of the IT department, but it's also that of the general management. Also, properly implemented technical solutions guided by policy are essential to an information program. Okay, let's move on to intrusion detection and prevention systems. That's our first topic for this session. Now, an intrusion occurs when an attacker attempts to gain entry into or disrupt the normal operation of an organization's information systems. As we have studied from previous sessions, when someone who has, does not have authorization, it decides to penetrate or disrupt or have access to information that is not due them, we can term that as intrusion. Now, intrusion prevention consists of activities that deter an intrusion. Any activity or sets of activities that you take to be able to prevent an intrusion from occurring is what is considered as intrusion prevention. Now, intrusion detection consists of procedures and systems that identify system intrusion. So, on the occurrence of an intrusion, the procedures you take to be able to identify the intrusions that have occurred is what is referred to as intrusion detection. Then we have intrusion reaction, which encompasses actions an organization undertakes when intrusion event is detected. So why the need for intrusion detection prevention systems? First and foremost, the primary purpose is to identify and report an intrusion. Also, that you can quickly contain an attack and prevent or mitigate the loss of loss or damage. Another usefulness of intrusion detection and prevention systems is to detect and deal with preambles to attacks. Now, data collection allows the organization to examine what has happened after an intrusion and why. It's important for any organization to be able to analyze by collecting data after an intrusion has happened so that to be able to build up mechanism to fight against anything that looks like an attack of a similar nature in the future. Now, intrusion detection prevention system also serve as a deterrent by increasing fear of detection. If an attacker tries to intrude in your system and you are able to steady the attacker, it serves as a warning to the attacker that when they make the attempt again to want to, uh, to attack you, you have built defenses to be able to counter that attack. Another usefulness of intrusion detection prevention systems is that it can help management with quality assurance and continuous improvement. There are an, a, a couple of types of intrusion de detection prevention systems. So we'll look at them. They are split into two, mainly the network-based and the host based. The network based is focused on protecting the network information assets. So we look at wireless intrusion detection prevention systems, which studies the network behavior and analyzes any kind of intrusion that exists therein. Also with the network based intrusion detection prevention systems, we realize that it usually resides on a computer or an appliance which is connected to a segment of an organization's network. 
So it looks for indications of attack. So you find this application sitting on a particular computer or an appliance which is connected to the network to be able to study what is happening, the forms of attacks that come in onto the network. Now, when you're examining the packet under the network-based intrusion detection prevention systems, you realize that it looks for the attacks pattern within the network traffic. So it studies the pattern of the attacks that are coming in to be able to collect data about it, then build a mechanism to be able to prevent any future attacks of that kind. Now, it's usually installed at specific places in the network where it can monitor the traffic that is going into and out of that particular network segment. So that is for the network-based intrusion detection prevention system. Then we'll look at the other type, which is the host-based intrusion detection and prevention systems. This one usually resides on a particular server or host, and it monitors activities only on that system. So not like the network-based, where it is on the computer or, or an appliance, which is connected to a network to study a network. This one sits on a particular host, a particular computer, and monitors activities only on that system. Now, it benchmarks and monitors in the status of key system files and detects whether intruder creates, modifies, or deletes files. So with the host intrusion and detection prevention systems, it's able to go a further step to detect to see whether the intrusion that was done or the intruder created or modified or deleted files, and so on and so forth. Now, most host-based intrusion detection and prevention systems work on the principle of configuration or change management. With that said, we'll take a look at certain detection methods under intrusion detection and prevention systems. The first we'll look at is the signature-based detection. And what is this about? This is the case where, with the signature-based detection, we examine the network traffic in search of patterns that match known signatures. So we search the network to be able to figure out if we can come up with patterns that match certain known signatures. Then another method for detection, another way about it is that it is widely used because many attackers have clear and distinct signatures. Most of the attacks that we have are from people who are identified by certain unique signatures. So it will be useful to be able to have a pattern of such signatures to be able to detect them. And the problem with this approach is that the new attack, when there's a new attack pattern, it must continually add it to the intrusion detection system database of signatures. If not, it will not identify it as a signature to a certain attack. And for that matter, it will not be able to have any detection or prevention methods to that particular attack. Now, the second kind of method for detection under the detection and prevention of intrusion systems is the anomaly based. This is a behavior based detection. It collects that scale summaries by observing traffic known to be normal. So anytime any traffic that is being collected has an abnormal behavior, then care is taken, it is grouped, it is studied so that we'll be able to know that. We'll be able to, in future, go about putting aside any such traffic that is of similar behavior because it has behaved out of the, the normal. There's a weakness to this because certain activities happen on the network which allows a usual normal traffic to behave abnormally. And if care is not taken, such activities might be classified as abnormal uh, behavior and it might be detected and prevented when it's not supposed to have been. Okay. Now we'll take a look at the response behavior of intrusion detection and prevention system. Now, the intrusion detection prevention system's response to external stimulation depends on the configuration and functions. There are many response options that are available. Responses can be classified as active or passive. Now, if a response is active, what it means is that you're collecting additional information about the intrusion. You're modifying the network environment and taking action against the intrusion. If you are doing this, then we say that the response is at an active one. Now, it becomes a passive one when the setting, you set off alarms or no notifications and collect passive data through SNP traps. And if you go about the response in this manner, then we say that this kind of response is a passive 
response. Okay, so we'll now take a look at some strengths and limitations of intrusion detection and prevention systems. The first one is that one very good thing that intrusion detection systems are able to do is that they're able to monitor and analyze systems, events, and user behavior. Another thing that they do very well at is testing security states of system configuration. They're able to test the security states of system configurations. They are also able to recognize patterns of system events corresponding to known attacks. Then they can also recognize activity patterns that vary from normal activity. Let's take a look at some limitations to that. One thing that intrusion detection prevention systems cannot do or perform badly at is compensating for weak or missing security mechanisms in protection infrastructure. If there is a weak or missing security mechanism, they are not able to compensate for it. So that's a weakness that they have. Another weakness is that there's an instantaneously, they're not able to instantaneously detect, report, respond, and respond to attack when there is a heavy network or processing load. So anytime there's heavy network or processing load, they fail to be able to instantaneously detect and report and respond to the attacks that are happening. So that is one major flaw or limitation to the systems. Another is that they are not able to effectively respond to attacks by sophisticated attackers. Anytime there's an attack from a sophisticated attacker, it becomes a problem for them to be able to respond to. Another limitation that we want to look at is they are not able to detect new attacks or variants of existing attacks. That's a major flaw. Then lastly, we'll, and that, lastly, we'll look at a limitation which has to do with they are not able to automatically investigate attacks without human intervention. So these are just to mention a few of the, the strengths and the limitations of intrusion detection and prevention systems. Now, to be able to deploy and implement an intrusion detection and prevention system, we want to have this in mind. First and foremost, such a system can be implemented through one of three control strategies. So there are three strategies by which we can deploy and implement. The first one has to do with, the first one is done central, in centrally. So we have a centralized way of deploying and implementing them. We have one that is done in a fully distributed manner. Then we have one that is done in a partially distributed manner. Now, when it is centralized, it means all the prevention systems, control factors are implemented and managed in a central location. When we say it is fully distributed as a strategy, it means that all control functions are applied at the physical location of each of the system's components. Then if we have a partially distributed strategy for implementation and deployment, then it means that we combine the two. We'll have a bit of a centralized and a bit of a distributed. Okay. Let's look at how we we'll measure the effectiveness of intuition, detection, and prevention systems. So first of all, they are evaluated using four dominant metrics. We'll mention them briefly. One is thresholds. We are able to evaluate them using a metric we know as thresholds. Another, blacklists and whitelists. Then the third is alert settings. Then finally, we are able to evaluate them by code viewing and editing. Code viewing and editing. Okay. Some of these testing processes will enable the administrator to. We are still looking at measuring the effectiveness. So, some of these testing processes, which help us to be able to measure the effectiveness of intrusion detection and prevention systems enables the administrator to be able to record and retransmit packets from real virus or worm scans. When a worm scan or a real virus scan is done, it allows the administrator to be able to record and retransmit the packets from them. It also allows the administrator to record and retransmit packets from a real virus or worm scan with incomplete TCP IP session connections. That is, we're talking about missing 
as seen packet. Then finally, it allows the administrator to be able to conduct a real virus or worm scan against a hardened or sacrificial system. Another, measure, another thing to look at under the measuring of the effectiveness of these systems is that testing process should be a real, as realistic as possible. With that said, let us now move on to some scanning and analysis tools. So under that, when we talk about scanning tools, they are typically used to collect information that an attacker needs to launch a successful attack. So to be able to collect the information that an attacker used to be able to launch an attack means that you have been able to scan. Then the attack protocol is usually a logical sequence of steps or processes used by the attacker to launch an attack against the target. So to be able to scan means that after being able to collect information, you have actual um, a logical sequence of steps which the attacker used to launch the attack against that particular system. Then in scanning, we, we do footprinting. And this is simply the process of collecting publicly available information about a potential target. OK, so we have port scanners. Remember, we are talking about scanners and analysis tools. So scanning and analysis tools. So we have what we call port scanners. They are tools that are used by both attackers and defenders to identify or fingerprint computers active on the network and other useful information. So they can either perform a generic scan or those for specific types of computers, protocols, or resources. They are port scanners. So anything that has to do with a port, these are able to scan those particular ports. So both an attacker and a defender, one who's preventing attack, can use port scanners for their activities. Now, the more specific the scanner is, the more useful its information is to attacker and defenders, most definitely. If you look on the screen, you realize that this is a table that has some of the well-known ports and protocols that are attached to those ports. The very popular one that we know is the echo port, that's for port, seven, port number seven. We have the SMTP for mail, mails, the DNS, that's for 25, for 53 respectively, 110 for pop, and so on and so forth. We'll take a look at firewall analysis tools now. Now, several tools automate re remote discovery of firewall rules and assist the administrator or attacker in analyzing them. And this is what we want to take a look at. Now, with regards to firewall analysis tools, the administrators who feel wary of using the same tools that attackers use should note this. That first and foremost, the, users, the user intent dictates how gathered information will be used. Whatever the intention the user had is actually going to guide how the information that has been gathered will be used. And researchers will also want to bear in mind that to defend a computer or network well, they, the administrators, must understand ways it can be attacked. You must know, as an administrator, the possible ways that an attack can be launched on you. You must be able to understand that these are the possible ways that there are for an attack, to be able to understand how to come about a defense against such an attack. Now, a tool that can help close an open or poorly configured firewall will help the network defender minimize risk from attack. Definitely, if you have the right to that will help to prevent an attack, you minimize the risk of an attack. Then we have the operating system detection tools. We are still looking at scanning tools and analysis tools. So one of such is the operating system detection tools. And this one has the ability to detect a target computer's operating system is very valuable to an attacker. So the tool has the ability to detect a target computer's operating system. And this is very, a very valuable thing to an attacker. So once the OS is known, the attacker can easily determine the vulnerability to which it is susceptible. If I know a particular OS running a particular machine, 
I will know what form of attack to use and what kind of attack or approach not to use. So it is very important a tool to have, an operating system detection tool. Not just for an attacker, but for a defense, for the defense also. Now many tools use network, networking protocols to determine a remote computer's OS. So that's how the OS of computers are found out by the attackers. Then we have other scanners that we'll, we'll mention briefly. Further reading will be found in chapter seven of the recommended text. So we have here the vulnerability scanners, the packet sniffers, the wireless security tools. And with that, we want to wrap up on this. We are, we've, been talk, we've been talking about intrusion detection systems, and we've mentioned that they detect violation of its configuration and activates a certain alarm. We've mentioned that there are majorly two types of it. We have the network base and we have the host base. Then we've looked at selecting the best intrusion detection for, um, prevention systems product that best fits an organization's needs, making sure that it's able to fight against the challenging and complex nature of whatever the attack that comes to it is. We've also looked at scanning and analysis tools that are used to pinpoint vulnerabilities in systems, holes in security components, and unsecured aspects of a network. With this, we come to an end of this session. Thank you very much.